You're watching Rogers TV, Barry. Welcome to Educate, Inform, and Challenge. My name is Teresa McLennan. I'm the Executive Director of the Women and Children's Shelter of Barry. We talk about gender-based violence, gender equity, but we also talk about women in leadership and decision making, and also women in our community who are doing incredibly great work. And we always want to provide an opportunity to showcase that work, and also we, that we can uh, use the information and to educate and challenge our thinking. And that is what I'm really hoping is gonna happen for all of us here today. Before we begin, we do want to thank our Indigenous community and partners Thank you for allowing us to share in this space with you and to have these conversations. We thank you so much. I am honored today to talk to Sarah Petal, Executive Director of the Busby Centre, and we are going to be diving into some uh, conversation today to really help us to understand the lives and experiences of the clients that the Busby Centre supports. And we're going to do that from a place of respect and non-judgment, really with an eye to understand those experiences. So Sarah, welcome. And I am really looking forward to our conversation today. Can you, in a nutshell, really talk to us about the work that happens at the Busby Centre? Let's start there. So the Busby Centre has uh, been around for almost 30 years now. So it was started in the basement of Trinity Church and we've evolved many times. Um, and now we are um, a pretty large organization within the community serving people that are experiencing homelessness and that who are at risk of imminent homelessness. So it's really important to us to, to make sure that people are um, having the shortest path from homelessness to housing and being able to keep their housing if they have their housing. And so do you have a shelter site, outreach services? Just give us a brief kind of rundown of what that looks like. Yeah, for sure. So we, uh, pre-pandemic, because we, we have a bit of a pandemic response that we're in as well right now, um, but pre-pandemic, we have a 24-7 service hub at 88 Mulcaster Street. And so we have a drop-in center and community breakfast. Um, and then in the evenings that turns into the overnight uh, emergency group lodging. So we, um, the end of the cold program in Barrie disbanded and we took on that role in the community a few years ago. Uh, so that's been a, a really big part of the work that we're doing um, as well as we have a street outreach team. So we've been doing that work formally since 2009. So we have outreach workers that go into encampments, go onto the street, go to people where they are um, maybe precariously housed and meet people where they're at and give them provisions around food and clothing um, and any kind of support that they need. Uh, we also have Lucy's Place, which is our supportive housing program. So we uh, have converted a, a motel um, in Barrie with Redwood Park Communities and we have a supportive housing uh, program that serves 19 individuals um, and we actually are adding some units there uh, so that people that have experienced chronic homelessness have a supportive program where they can recover from their homelessness and be uh, accepted and move through the transition to uh, traditional housing. So those are our, our main programs. And recently we just took on the Collingwood out of the cold program as well. And we are facilitating a shelter in, in Collingwood. Uh, and, then, and then in the pandemic, we are actually, we're now operating our shelter out of one of the local hotels in Barrie in partnership with Elizabeth Fry Society. So it's been a lot of work right now in the community. A lot of work to adapt and change in the COVID pandemic and, and an incredible need that existed long before the pandemic. And almost I would say that homelessness is its own pandemic that we have been faced with for years and years that we still can't get a handle on. So I'm gonna ask you a, a very brief question that I know we're gonna dive into. How do people find themselves without a home to live in? There's definitely a variety of reasons, and we, we do know that. Um, you know, some people, it's, it's uh, family breakdown, marital breakdown, um, domestic violence. Uh, we have individuals that have struggled with their mental health and addiction, and that has been a result of their homelessness. 
a big one is affordability right now. Um, as you said, we we've we have a few different pandemics happening. We have a, a housing crisis, an opiate crisis, and uh, the pandemic happening all at the same time. Uh, so those are some of the reasons that are, that we're finding um, that people are experiencing homelessness. Uh, we did just complete our 2022 homelessness enumeration survey, um, where we we identified that there was 722 people in in Simcoe County that were experiencing homelessness on that given night, and. 441 of them we surveyed and within that survey uh, the top one that was identified was 53 percent was the affordability factor um, we have 41 percent of people with it, it was five, uh, personal issues so family issues that were happening 33 percent were health so people that had you know um, been healthy and were working and then fell ill uh, ended up, you know, not being able to f afford their housing any longer and are now on the street very ill um, with a variety of illnesses. So those are really, really um, everyday stories that we're seeing for people. Um, and it's really devastating to, to see. And I think it really speaks to that for any one of us, this could be our lives at any moment in time, that there could be an illness that happens in my uh, myself, or my partner that changes our financial situation and we find ourselves without housing that we can afford. And I think that it is so good for our viewers to hear that we are we can all be one step away from the folks that we see standing on the street because they have no home. And we can have a lot of judgment about those folks, can't we? Yeah, it is it is unfortunate because um, people see the behaviors that, that come out sometimes and they they define individuals by those behaviors. And that's it's it's really sad because these are um, individuals that are, belong to families. They're somebody's brother or sister or mother, grandmother, um, you know, and, you know, they were business owners and have fallen on hard times or um, we're hard workers. We have you know, people from the trades and, and all these different backgrounds. And ultimately, they're human beings. And so the judgment upon somebody else is actually my judgment on myself, right? I have to really respect what's happening for somebody and try to understand what's going on. And that a lot of the behaviors that are coming out are, are really about survival. You know, somebody that's living on social assistance at this point or, um, you know, employment insurance or a, a disability pension or even old age pension it's it's not even close to being able to afford housing at this point you know barry is just the, the the rents have soared and it hasn't met up with with the um, what people have for for allocations to be able to get housing so a shelter portion for for assistance is under 500 dollars a month you can't find housing for that. You can't find housing for that for sure. And, uh, and you know, we, our shelter, we just uh, last year opened up a transitional home, right? Where the rent is basically nothing because we want to try and support women to still get safety uh, and the support that they need in terms of housing and to be able to save for their future, you know. But we honestly don't know what that looks like for them either. You know what I mean? And I really want to, touch on something that you said that I think was very brilliant, uh, you know, just about the judgment towards people. We always say here at our shelter that when we judge a woman who comes to us, it speaks to a healing that needs to happen within us, not them. And so I think it is just really great to highlight that. And I, and I just really appreciate everything that you've said. And the first half of our show has already gone by so quickly because there's just so much that we can talk about. I would like to ask you about the intersection of that mental health pieces that people may be experiencing and also substance use. How does that intersect with homelessness? We are seeing obviously a, a pretty high number of individuals that are struggling with mental health and addiction. Um, I believe that it is very much a systemic situation that uh, again, our, our country is not set up um, 
really accessible services for people that are struggling with mental health and addiction. And particularly in our area, we struggle. We do struggle and we try, but we struggle. And um, it's one of those things where, you know, I, I, I'm constantly saying we have broken systems in our country and unfortunately the individuals we're serving happen to be the collateral damages of, of those broken systems. And that's really what it comes down to when it comes to mental health and addiction. You know, um, people want to get into treatment, uh, but to get into treatment is extremely hard. Um, it is not an easy accessible situation. It's not like you can wait wake up and say, hey, I'm going to go to treatment today. It is months of grueling follow-up for an individual who's already struggling. Um, and if they have comorbidities where they are struggling with mental health and addiction, you know, trying to get through the day, let alone get through months of following up, it's it's it can be grueling. And you know, we know that within this population and really just in addiction as it as it stands itself, you know, there's windows of opportunity when people are ready to make some changes. And if we don't embrace that and have really immediate accessible treatment um, and support programs and, and networks, then what ends up happening is that window closes very quickly because the reality of, of suffering through the next day creates the, the, the need to go back and, and use substances because then I don't have to deal with my reality. And I think that there's a lot of judgment on like from general society around that, that people, you know, choose to do this. And I, I think that it's a, a choice out of a lack of choices. And it's such an intersection with so many things that, you know, we see certainly with the women that we support as well. And that's why we're always, you know, endeavoring to take that trauma informed approach to understanding mm -hmm. that, right? And talking with clients to ask them tell us about your experience because it really does help to paint a picture about why they feel that they need to use substances to be able to cope with the trauma that they've experienced we you know we we always say it is not about uh you know what that person is doing it's about what happened to them but it is really hard to get the community uh, at large to understand that how successful can a person be in terms of finding housing? In this climate, it's almost extinct, to be honest, because, um, you know, you could find housing, but it's it's usually a room and it may not be in the best setting, um, you know, but to find safe and affordable housing that somebody can actually, you know, make some life changes within that supportive network, it's pretty much non-existent. You know, I, I hate to say that, but it's the reality of what is in front of us right now. Um, you know, we we are serving between Elizabeth Fry and Busby Center within this hotel model right now, over 200 people a day. And we just think about it every day thinking, where are we going to house people when this, when this model is finished? And it's very concerning to us because, you know, again, these are human beings. No matter no matter what what your judgment of of them is, they're human beings. They have heartbeats, and you know we care about what's happening for them. So you know between the people that are living unsheltered and then people that are staying within our shelters, it's it's really not a great situation that we're we're dealing with. And then on top of that, you know, I'll be honest, our staff are are almost vying for the same places because the affordability has just gone so off the rails and there's not a lot of, um, again, added support or, or supplements or subsidies or anything like that. So we're gonna dive in a lot more to this because this is so key. The real conversation that our community really needs to hear. So please our viewers stay with us. We're gonna dive in some more and talk with Sarah and we will be right back after this very, very short commercial break. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Oh, wow. 
Heart and Home original series. Wind Calls the Heart returns with an all new season. Constable, I wrote this as a love letter to my son and to everyone else in this town. I can't quite outrun my past. Fire! We're on the threshold of a new era here. Wind Calls the Heart, season nine. Focus better. Partner better. Sleep better. Breathe better. Love better. Work better. Friend better. Unwind better. Everything gets better when you get active. back to educate inform and challenge we're having a very insightful conversation with my friend sarah petal from the busby center and we are talking about the issue of homelessness and we know so many people in our community know about this incredible issue for people to find safe and affordable housing what we want to talk about right now and to shed light on is the opioid crisis that is happening right here in our city in our backyard sarah can you talk to us about how you're seeing the opioid crisis play out in the clients that you support, like the numbers, what's happening for the Busby Centre? So we've seen definitely an increase in opiate use um, and toxic drug crisis uh, over the last uh, couple of years within the pandemic. So we've, we've definitely had um, you know, this happening within our community for some time, but it's definitely exacerbated. So our staff not only are now shelter workers where they're trying to help people get housing and mental health support and get connected to services, but they are responding to overdose on a daily basis. So our team within the last year has responded to 112 overdoses on site. Um, unfortunately, we did lose five individuals during that time um, to the to uh, overdose uh, or toxic drug poisoning. And it is devastating. It's devastating to watch um, people in that much hurt. Um, and then on top of that, to have our staff responding and, and creating almost more trauma to more individuals through that. Um, because, you know, it's it, it takes a lot to respond to those types of situations. You're finding people essentially lifeless and so our staff are are now experiencing that trauma and my concern has always been that eventually you know i don't I, we always try to get as much support as we can for our staff and we've got a lot of amazing partners that have helped out with that um because i don't want to see that the trauma that's being that's happening within this this crisis then it exacerbates to the point where the individuals that are working for us become homeless or, or become unwell themselves. Um, so it's just, it speaks a lot to how sheltering has changed and the work has changed. Um, but we have an amazing group of people that show up every day to do this work and to make sure that these individuals are given the dignity and respect that even though they're struggling with their, their use, that we're there to make sure that they don't pass away because we want to make sure that we keep them here they're really important to us and um, again these are our family members to somebody and and they're they're important to our community and so we want to make sure that we we bring them back it is such great work that you're doing that your team is doing sarah and i don't think you ever get enough credit for the difficult work and support and that you know your team wants the best for the folks who cross their path right who use those services right it is truly admirable because and again i think that you face a lot of difficulties you know that the community doesn't understand the complexities and um maybe that's fear-based maybe they have a lot of fear and I'm not entirely sure, right? But I think uh, your work is incredible and it's so needed, obviously. I guess the question that I wanna ask you, which is a loaded one, what is the answer? <laughs> and that's gonna be multifaceted. 
But from your perspective, your knowledge, what you see in the front lines, what is the answer to, to this problem? It is very much multifaceted, and it, it's it's a it's a big it's a big situation we're dealing with, right? Um, because there's just so many different components to it. But ultimately, it's about an understanding. It's about acceptance of people as people, and creating different toolboxes within our, our tools in our toolbox in our community. You know, around the opiate crisis, around housing, around services, around mental health support. Um, because it's not a one size fits all. You know, we, we can't expect that everybody is going to fit into the same box or the same round hole. Like this is, you know, it's so important to realize that people are unique and they have unique challenges. So we need to have, you know, deep investments into housing and mental health support and addiction support and harm reduction programs because this is not something that is gonna go away overnight. This is something that's gonna take hard work from the community and, and you know, agencies working together as we all are. Um, you know, people that are using our services wanna be part of the solution too. Uh, we have an amazing ambassador group that go and clean up and stuff and then they give us really great insight to, to what's happening for them and what they need and and what even even within our own program. I, I love it when they're like, you know, you kind of have this this expectation of us, but like that doesn't really make sense. Well then great, help me make sense of it, right? And and they've they really just have so much more to give us if we treat them with dignity and respect and acceptance. You know, so I think it is gonna take it's gonna take investment. It's going to take deep investment. And I don't mean to line the pockets of agencies. Nobody nobody wants that. Not, none of us that are running agencies want that. We want it to go to the people. And that's where it's so important is to make sure that housing is being built. We are constantly advocating for more housing to be built. You know, we know that what the needs are, we need to start acting on that. And and there are some projects that are up come up and coming, but it's really important to not take the the your foot off the pedal on that. Um, you know, yeah. th there's definitely more conversations happening within partnerships around making sure that someone's feeling supported um, in that transition because maybe they've been out there. We have one guy in our, our Lucy's Place program. He had been out there for 20 years. He didn't even know, he, th the first day he moved in, he said, I didn't even know that I knew how to go to the grocery store anymore. You know, those are really important pieces. Like transition through with people, support them where they're at but also make those investments in the community so that we can really start to tackle this problem instead of just complaining about it. And you spoke a lot about uh, housing stock. I mean, housing stock is vitally important. You've got to have a space, right? But what has to go hand in hand with just four walls? It has to be, again, the, the supports around it. So, and it, it, again, a variety of them. It can't be, you know, that only this agency can do that work or, or whatever the case. It needs to be that we are creating those, those environments for people to be able to access that work, that we're um, not asking people to come to offices all the time, that we're reaching out to them. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm always thinking about is we in transitional housing, and you can appreciate this, we move people into transitional housing. And then after four years, we say, okay, now you need to go. And I look at it as why don't we find houses, put some staff in there, start to back the staff out. And then there's your house, right? What like flip some things on its head, let's get innovative and creative and, and ask people what they want. Because again, it's it's so important to not you know, I, I hear constantly, you know, we need to build community, but we need to build their type of community, like what people want. And and I don't, I shouldn't say they, I, 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 I keep saying they, and it's not intentional, um, but it's really important to realize that the, the people that are using the services need to be part of that conversation and solution, right? That this isn't just about us and what we think is best. Yeah. And I love that. And, you know, our agency, we are, woman directed so women tell us what the services are that they want and we have a, a survivors group that we ask them to use their voice in the community as they feel comfortable and i can only just think about with the work that you're doing and supporting folks how important it is to hear from your folks like 
to say to the community, this is what would help me. This is what I need. Wouldn't you love for someone in the community who's maybe carrying a lot of judgment and a lot of opinions about folks to have five minutes to sit down with one of your clients and to hear their story and to gain a deeper understanding about what that person's experience has really been like. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, you know, it, it it's one of those things where people, if you don't know, you don't know. Right. So if you get the time to actually talk to people and just, you know, again, not from a voyeuristic point of view, but from a knowledge exchange, right? How, what is it like to be in your shoes for the day? Because I haven't experienced that. And I think that, that if community gets more involved in things like that, we could get a lot further ahead and and not all of our commercials and all that kind of stuff and our interviews with people where they watch it on the internet, but actually asking people, how are you? You know, if somebody's panhandling, ask them how they are that day. You know, you know, don't don't just, you know, think about it as as that they're doing something wrong. You know, even a hello is really important, right? So um, we're we're really big on hiring our our uh, individuals as well. So people that are using our program and that um, are wanting to be part of our peer program, uh, you know, they work through that and then our regular you know regular employees like we don't define them as anything else because they bring such value you know to our work and we're very fortunate you know i feel very privileged to meet all the people i've been with the center 15 years and i feel very privileged to have met the amazing people that i meet every day and i love coming to work every day even though it is hard and it is heartbreaking there is so much resilience within this population and within the people that I get to meet that it's inspiring. It's absolutely inspiring. I think we all have a lot to learn from the people that we support. And, you know, we learn something new every single day from, uh, you know, just in our, our, our agency here, the women that we support, they teach us. And we say that we are the women that we support and they are us. And, you know, we want to come from a place of, of learning about them. And Absolutely. So we have had a very quick conversation here, Sarah, and I know the unfortunate piece is that so many of us have to fundraise to make ends meet in terms of our agency. How can someone support the BuzzFeed Centre and get behind the work that you do? How can, how can we become involved? So we do have a monthly 50-50 draw right now. Um, so it's, you can get uh, access to that off of our website um, or our Facebook page. That's um, something that we're running every month. We are always looking for um, monthly donors and supporters that way. Because um, again, it, it does take a village. You know, we all have to put, you know, put ourselves forward to, to be able to do this work. And it's really, that's really important. Um, we will have some more events coming up. We have a gala coming up, you know, pending that we don't get closed down again, um, but we will have a, a gala event coming up in November. Um, so again, just trying to, you know, follow us on Facebook and, and um, Twitter and Instagram to see what the next up and coming event is. Um, if you want to create your own uh, fundraiser on behalf of our organization, we think that that's absolutely amazing and we appreciate it. Um, so just connect with us, our email, at getconnected at busbycenter.ca. And yeah, we would appreciate all the support. Um, we appreciate that every agency needs the support too. And, um, you know, we, that people have charities of choice and we hope that we become somebody's charity of choice today. Sarah, thank you so much for our conversation today. It went by way too fast, and there's so much more that I feel we could talk about. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.